Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by Alistair Henry. He is an author of memoirs and creative fiction. He is a double lung transplant recipient. He's a storyteller as well as an adventurous, adventurous boomer. We're going mm-hmm. to be talking to him about his story, about his volunteer work and his, his explorer how he's explored different places. So, Alistair, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Oh, it's my pleasure to have you. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Well, for most of my working life, I was just a regular guy. I I I was in the corporate world. I was like a yuppie. But I was fortunate to retire at the age of 57. eh? Wasn't that wonderful? That's what everybody wants to do. But two years later, I was saying to myself, is this it? Is this all there is? I'm only 59. I can't play golf and cut grass for the rest of my life. There's got to be more to life than this. But I didn't want to go back in the corporate world. I'd had my fill of that. I didn't want to go back in the city. I wanted something like an adventure. So I looked around and I found this wonderful opportunity in Canada's Northwest Territories. It was in a little remote fly-in community of 300 Chippewan. They were living on the east arm of Great Slave Lake and uh, they were looking for a general manager to manage their development corporations. So, cut long story short, I applied. I got the job. Upon reflection, I think I was the only guy that applied. But anyway, at the time, I I felt very fortunate. I thought, wow, I got the job. But later on in life, I thought, maybe I was the only guy, you know. But anyway, so I went to Lutz OK, and it was uh, like going to the moon. A totally different world, totally outside of ours, our society. You know, they still hunt, trap, and fish. And the thing is, the North is a very, very dangerous place if you're not mindfully aware. Like in the city, I used to be preoccupied with this, that. Sometimes I drove somewhere and I thought, wow, how did I get here? I can't remember stopping at any traffic lights. I must have been on uh, auto control. Well, in the north, you can't live like that because it's so, you know, blizzards come up for days on end. There's bears and wolverines. They live in the moment. They really do. They don't worry. They just go with the flow. And as I, and I adopted that attitude, you know, go with the flow and make it up as you go. I love it. <laughs> and actually, I did that for the rest of my life. But there was many things, as I say, I went in there as this businessman with all these, you know, strong business practices that I'd learned and all about setting expectations and goals and objectives. Well, none of that worked. In the end, I realized, you know, people just do their best and you have to just celebrate that. And you can't fault it. If they could have done, could have done better, they would have. So what's the point in saying we didn't meet expectations? You know, I realized setting expectations, it just sets you up for disappointments. So I stopped having expectations. And then I just celebrated whatever was done, was done. Anyway, I was there for two years and it was really, it was wonderful. I went to spiritual gatherings. I went out uh, into the bush, checking the trap lines. I got myself a snow machine, and every month I would drive across the lake to Yellowknife to buy groceries. So I had a, I had a, 
a snow machine and a sled. And with a buddy, with uh, Dave and Paula, he had a machine too. The two of us would go. It was five hours straight across the lake. And the lake was like a billiard table. You could go 80, 90, 100, because you could see right ahead. It was wonderful. So I had lots of those wonderful experiences. But after two years, and your time is a strange concept. I felt like I'd been there forever, but I looked at the calendar and thought, no, I've only been here two years, but it felt like a lifetime. And I thought, okay, I'm not Denny, you know, time to move on. So I left the community. Well, the other thing, the other thing, Curtis, when I was in the corporate world, I was the vice president of finance, okay? So my life was all about boardrooms, spreadsheets, meetings. I didn't really have much uh, in involvement with people. But uh, as I say, you know, after two years being retired, I felt unfulfilled. That's uh, That was the thing. I didn't have that personal sort of fulfillment. I felt a little bit anxious and empty. Well, in Lutz, okay, because I was an outsider, you know, there's only 300 people, and most of them are all related anyway, because they've got this thing about keeping the bloodlines pure, you know. <laughs> I didn't want to tell them that we think differently about it. But anyway, and they all know one another's business, and it's just a big community. Everybody does everything. So everybody knows everybody's business. Well, because I was an outsider, they would come and say, can I, uh, can I run something by you? Initially, my reaction was, no way. You know, I'm not a counsellor. I'm a businessman. I'm I'm here running your development corporations. But uh, I had payroll too, you see. Uh, there was a number of them in the community. I had two fire crews. So there were 16 people, two crews of eight. So I had their, their payroll. I had guys that went out, flew out to the ice road and uh, maintained the ice road. And then I had other ones that, well, there were some diamond mines. There was Rio Tinto, BHP Billiton. So they had these big diamond mines. And um, so they needed janitors and uh, cooks. So a lot of the people in the community, you know, had those jobs. So I realized, you know, uh, that there was no bank. There was nothing. It looks okay. There was absolutely nothing except a grocery store, the co-op store. No coffee shop, nothing. And none of them had bank accounts or credit cards. They just lived, you know, paycheck to paycheck. But every once in a while, they'd get into a little bit of a trouble and they'd come and see me and something had come up. Anyway, cut long story short, I didn't see any problem buying things on my credit card and getting paid for it out of payroll deduction. I, I mean, there was no risk. And yet other people said, my, you know, you crazy. And that's when I realized, you know, I can make people happy by sharing what I have. So in this case, it was credit cards, but also with my skills. You know, I was giving people advice and uh, teaching them a little bit of financial planning because they, they just lived in the moment, you know. Anyway, cut long story short, Curtis. I came out of there and I decided, okay, I'm not ready to go back to playing golf. I found an organization called VSO, Volunteer Services Overseas. It was a British sending agency, volunteer sending agency. So I applied and they sent me to Dhaka, Bangladesh for two years. That was really good because uh, I was working for a local NGO, a non-government organization. VSO was, uh, it paid my flight, paid my uh, medications, uh, you know, uh, my injections that I needed before I went, vaccinations. Uh, they found me uh, some accommodation and they gave me a little stipend for food and local travel, which of course is all by rickshaw and uh, what they call CNG. Compressed natural gas, the little uh, three-wheeler car, uh, scooter type things anyway. And I had to learn Bangla. Could you believe that? 
a guy at my age learning another language. Fortunately, I didn't have to learn too much. Unfortunately, Bangla is an easy language to learn. It's simple. Like in English, we've got so many words for say good. We've got fantastic, super, wonderful. In, in Bangla, they just got one word, and that's... Uh, uh, I forgot what it is. It was so long ago. Anyway, I was there for two years, and then um, I came back to Canada because it was a two-year contract. And um, the other thing I should have told you, that uh, when I was in Lutzoke, I sold my house. Eh? I sold everything and uh, never regretted anything, you know, never regretted having less and felt. I, you know, I like that uh, feeling of lightness, that uh, there was no baggage. I didn't feel heavy. And I guess I did before because um, before I went to Lutz OK, I, uh, I had a lovely place in the country. It was 50, 50 acres. Can you believe that? Five ponds, 18 acres of hardwood bush, and the rocky Sogin River flowed through the property. And yet, with all of that, I still felt empty. But now I was feeling good, because in Bangladesh I was working with the uh, local NGO, helping very, very abjectly poor people in uh, rural, coastal, and um, uh, sort of river little villages. And that's where I, you know, I was pleased I could help. They had a microcredit program. Now, a microcredit program, see, these very poor people, right? They don't have, they don't have anything. So nobody's going to loan them any money. They have no no job. Well, very, well, none of them are really employed. They're all subsistence. Anyway, with microcredit, it's, ne it's really good. You go into a little village and you say, okay, we're setting up a microcredit program. How many people want to join? 20 hands go up. You say, great, okay, we're going to meet every week and you're all going to put in a dollar, okay? So let's have a collection. So now, so it is appointed a treasurer, if you like. And the treasurer says, okay, I've got $20. Who wants to borrow $20 and what do you want to borrow it for? Because you have to pitch and these people here are going to vote. So somebody's going to get a $20. So somebody might say, well, I want to buy a chicken because I want to get into uh, eggs. Another person might say, I want some gardening tools. I want to plant vegetables. Another person said, you know, I want to buy coconuts and sell them in, in town. So they vote and they pick somebody and they get the 20 bucks. So the following week, they meet again. Now, the person that borrowed the money has to pay a dollar back plus his new dollar for the week. But, you know, the repayment rate was amazing because in their culture, reputation and their word is everything. And even if they didn't have the money, somebody would lend it to them. There was tremendous bonding and community support. And that's why that microcredit work, works throughout Asia. So anyway, I came back to Canada uh, just before Christmas. Uh, my daughter had a situation. She had lost her husband. He fell down the stairs and uh, cracked his head on the tiles. Went into a coma and three days later he didn't wake up. So she had to go back to work. But she needed to get some training. So she decided that she would go to a community college to take her like a police dispatching course. But she didn't have anybody to look after her little one-year-old boy. And all the daycare centers were all full. His name was down, but she had to start a course on January the 4th. Now, at the time, I should have been going to, I was supposed to be going to uh, Rwanda early in January. Anyway, I called them up and I said, no, can't go. I've got something else. So I looked after Beckett and, uh, anyway, Nikki, my daughter's family. So there was three children, two dogs, a cat, and, of course, meals. 
because uh, when she finished, you know, the whole thing is to get your foot in the door. But she had to go to the Toronto, uh, the Toronto ambulance was, was looking for a dispatcher. So she had to go and live and work in Toronto during the week. I looked after everything. But then eventually a job with the London police, I'm based, I'm based in London, Ontario, came up and, uh, and she got a job. So I was then free. In the meantime, I met a lady called Candace Witt. Well, I, I volunteered at the Northwest London Resource Centre, like a community resource centre. And a lady there called Candace Whitlock was the executive director. So I went on the board as treasurer, first of all, then chairman, and then I quit. Uh, but anyway, in the meantime, Candace... I told she was enthralled with what I told her about my volunteering in Bangladesh. And she said, that's what I want to do. So she applied and she got approved. And believe it or not, both of us got jobs in Kingston, Jamaica. Same, we start the same day, finish the same day. And they were on streets which were about three minutes apart. So Candace went down to work with the, the youth to try to, uh, her program was to try to convince the youth to go back to school. And my program was, was with the Dispute Resolution Foundation. This foundation taught people to be mediators and arbitrators because they were just short of uh, judges and, you know, courts. And if you're, if, if there was a dispute and you, like a civil dispute, you were looking at about 14 years. There was that many cases ahead of it. So the government of Jamaica said, you know what? We're going to train mediators. And so when, when people have a dispute, they can take it to a mediator, but the mediator is neutral. He just gets the two sides together and they have to um, speak by one at a time, no interruption. And you try to get each side to see the point of view of the other side. And then you say, you know, like, you've both got a compromise. And if you don't come to some agreement, you know, this is going to have to go, well, you're going to have to wait 14 years. And, you know, you're going to be 78 by the time this comes up. <laughs> so typically they usually you usually work it but the, the mediator is he doesn't he's not a judge and he doesn't give an opinion and say i think you should do this no he just suggests one goes back and forth you can't and, and i was a because uh, i took the course i loved it i love being a mediator but you know it's like a little bit of a game so you can say now if if billy gave you this could you so you can frame it that way you just can't say, I think. So anyway, that was that. We had a wonderful time in Kingston, Jamaica. We came home. And uh, of course, we're homeless, right? Candace sold up everything too. So we moved in with the kids uh, for a little while. But, you know, we were, I mean, they got their own families. We don't want to go imposing on them. I had a room, I had a bedroom in the basement of my daughter's house. It was, it was nice, it was comfortable, and it was, uh, but, uh, you know, I just felt like I was imposing, and Candace felt the same thing with her daughter. So the two of us decided, you know what, until the next assignment comes up, let's go backpacking. So we decided to go to Central America with just a 20-pound backpack, the way we did when we were in our 20s. No reservations, nothing. We just we just went. Because by this time, we were both just going with the flow, making it up as we go. So we flew to San Jose, Costa Rica, and uh, went all the way down into Panama, backpacked through Panama, back through Costa Rica and up into Nicaragua. And uh, we were destined to go to Guatemala. We had a friend there. But what happened, his brother in Montreal died. So he flew back to Montreal. So we changed our mind and we just said, well, you know, we'll go back to San Jose, Costa Rica and uh, stay there because we really love Costa Rica. 
And then we flew home. Oh, while we were there, uh, an assignment came up in Georgetown, Guiana. And a, uh, a position for Candace and a position for me. So that's where we went next, to Georgetown, Guiana, which is uh, in South America. It's the top right-hand corner, right up there in the top right, the only English-speaking country in um, in South America. Candace was working uh, with the disabled, helping them. Uh, well, what happened was the government passed a law that said disabled people have the same rights now as everybody else. But, you know, Guiana was very backward. If you had a disabled child, you basically kept him at home. There was all this shame and stuff like that going around with it. Weird, so bad. And there was no amenities, there was no ramps or anything. But um, and there was a lot of discrimination, you know, schools and things like this. Some teachers would say, I don't want him in my class. He's, he's disruptive. Well, after the law was passed, he couldn't say that. So one of Candace's jobs was um, with with three or four other, well, Candace isn't disabled, but with three disabled people, she formed a little committee that went round to the hospitals, the schools, to tell people you cannot discriminate against disabled people anymore. So that's what she did. And I worked with, um, just outside Georgetown was a little community called Agricola. It had been a plantation, John's Plantation, at one point, you know, with the col col British colonialists. Anyway, after emancipation, whatever it was, you know, where they got rid of uh, slavery, Jones, the plantation owner, gave a portion of the land to the slaves, and they named it Agricola. But... They were they never uh, they were discriminated against dangerous community with a very, very bad reputation. So any kid from Agricola applying for a job wouldn't get the job because the thought was nothing good comes out of Agricola. You know, they'll rob you. You can't trust them. And all nonsense with uneducated people. All right. Well, let's talk about your long transplant journey. We probably got about 25 more minutes or so. I want to get into your long transplant journey and also talk about your books. Okay, everybody, it's Michael E. Cullen II. And I'm Sesame Encarta from the All Too Real 2 podcast. We're passionate about movies, TV, and pretty much all things pop culture. Dive into the chaos of failed sitcoms, direct-to-video sequels, and the quirky realms of cinema and TV. Join us every Thursday for your dose of All Too Real 2 entertainment. We'll guide you through debates like whether Howard the Duck qualifies as a superhero. Ponder if Larry the Cable Guy could be the new Rock or Schwarzenegger. Discover if some shows and movies should have stayed in the cutting room. Ever heard of a sitcom featuring that dictator with the funny mustache? Well, we watched it. We're dedicated to unraveling the peculiarities of pop culture, sometimes with awesome guests. So, if you're into the eccentric world of pop culture, listen and subscribe to All Too Real 2. Available wherever you find podcasts and on Age of Radio. I came back to Canada, and we did the same thing. We said, you know, let, we was, had such a good time backpacking. Let's go again. We went to Southeast Asia for four months. We spent the first month in Bali, then Vietnam, up in Laos, Cambodia, Thailand. Had an amazing time. Now, at the same time, we were writing about it. So this is it. We, we ended up, I've written uh, four memoirs, 
and uh, just released a historical fiction novel. So the very first novel I wrote was about awakening in the Northwest Territories. Because it was so profound, I wanted to share my experience with other people. And uh, so that's what that book was about. Then we wrote a book called Go For It, Volunteering Adventures on Roads Less Travelled, which basically documents uh, our volunteering in Bangladesh, Jamaica and Guyana, and another one, Budget Backpacking for Boomers, because we did all this backpacking, believe it or not, on just $30 a day per person, and that covered accommodation, food and local travel. Now, we had to be, you know, I mean, sometimes local travel, it meant we took the overnight train. So we slept on the train uh, and, uh, you know, didn't have to pay for a hotel room. And the first thing we did, really, when we got to Costa Rica, we ordered a meal. Uh, but, you know, we're all the people. We couldn't eat that much. So we decided that from now on, we're going to buy one meal at like $14 and two plates. So our meal was only $7. So it is, and it's enough. You know, we don't want to get up feeling bloated from it. Because we were backpacking. We wanted to be as fit as possible. Anyway, uh, let, me just, uh, let me cut to the chase. January 2019, uh, I'd been a heavy smoker. I'd been a pack-a-day smoker, Curtis. Can you believe that? For 50 years. And I always thought one day is going to catch up with me, you know, as it did my relatives who were heavy smokers and died of lung cancer. So when I had was having trouble breathing, I thought, this is it, you know. It's been a good run. I've had a great life, um, but this is lung cancer. But it wasn't. The respirologist said it was idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It put me on oxygen 24-7. And, um, but even the fibrosis is a really chronic, you know, it's a, you got th three to six years life expectancy from uh, di diagnosis. So I asked about my situation. I said, well, what have I got? Three, five, six years? And they said, unfortunately, Alistair, your prognosis is quite advanced. We're going to give you 18 months at the most. So, Wow. But um, I wasn't too upset, you know, I expected it. It was my fault. Uh, but that gave me a best before date of June 2020. So, you know, when that happens, I mean, we're all going to die. And we all have a best before date, but people don't know what it is. But when you do it, man, it changes everything because I've got 18 months now. And the only thing I wanted to do was to go back to England uh, have a quality, spend some quality time with my three children, three grandchildren, Candice, uh, to say goodbye to my sister and my uh, nieces and nephews, because I'm from England. And when I came out, I came out by myself when I was 19 and nobody else came out. So, you know, don't have any real direct family in Canada. So that's what I did. So now I went back. That was wonderful. I went back. So about September, October, um, I was on originally three litres a minute of oxygen. But somebody came to the house once a month and uh, periodically, you know, took it up to five. So by Christmas, I was like on 10 litres. And I was aware I was, you know, going downhill. And I was aware of all the last, you know, the last birthday, last Christmas, last New Year. And I accepted that. But my children didn't. And they said, Dad, we want you to have a lung transplant. I said, bah, I don't think they do it for people my age. I said, anyway, I'll probably die right there on the operating table. And they said, well, you're going to die anyway, Dad, so we want you to look into it. So they pressured me to look into it, which I did. And uh, had to lose a little bit of body weight to get my body mass index down to the year. Uh, but by June... Because I went out, I started working out. By June, I, quite, I was eligible. I went on the wait list. I got the call twice to come to the hospital. 
twice I went up there and they said, sorry, the lungs just are not good enough. Go home. The third time I went up, they prepped me. Surgery was going to happen at 4.30 in the morning, or 6.30 in the morning. But four o'clock, a doctor came in and shook me and woke me up and he said, just to let you know, we've cancelled the surgery. The lungs just not good enough. So you'll be going home, okay? Go back to sleep. So I woke up in the morning. Candace came over from the hotel and we're getting ready to leave. And the doctor came back and he said, another set of lungs have just become available and they look really good. So don't go home. Can you hang on for an hour? He came back at 11 and he said, everything looks wonderful. We're going to take you into the operating theater at 4.30 this afternoon and I came out at 2.30 in the morning with new lungs how about that Curtis hmm? and, and I've had no problems that's two and a half years now that is absolutely amazing oh it is so with these new lungs I mean obviously it was, I call it the gift of life I could now continue to be part of my children and Candace's life and uh, so many other things I could finish my, the book well, I started a book, but I stopped because I thought, what's the point? You know, I'm not going to be here to finish the book and publish it. Anyway, I picked the book up and I continued to write it and I published it. And I've narrated it. Did you believe that? I mean, two year, January 2019, I'd hardly speak because, uh, well, I also had some emphysema from the smoking, you know. Anyway, I narrated that book, and I've narrated Awakening in the Northwest Territories. So there you go. And now I'm a guest on your show. Absolutely. And I know that the Internet is yeah. kind of a little spotty, so let's get out your contact information so the listeners can get your books and keep up with everything that you're up to. Yeah, if they go to my website, they can read a lot about everything. Uh, my website is very simple. It's just www.alistairhenry.com So on there I, I show the books with excerpts, the reviews uh, I, I write something about home children you probably don't know about home children Curtis but uh, my book is called The Soldier and the Orphan and the orphan turned out to be a home child England sent 120,000 children under the age of 13 to Canada to work as domestics and farm workers because they were short of labor. And these were orphans. You know, there was no, they didn't have any parents or siblings. So the government felt, yeah, we can ship these kids. So that's, they were called home children. And uh, so one of my, Tommy, in my book is a home child. But I think your your view, your listeners would love to read the book because it's a whole different world than uh, than the U.S., you know? I mean, in many respects, Canada, U.S. were very similar, but like in Canada, as I say, where I was with the indigenous people up in the Northwest Territories, it was like being on the moon, you know? No, I couldn't believe it. I said, I'm still in Canada. I, I, this is still North America. I felt like I was in Mongolia or somewhere. Anyway, what else might you want to know? Well, that's about it. I would say uh, that the listeners can go check out AlistairHenry.com. Keep up with everything that you're up to. I would like the listeners to follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible. If you have any suggestions for guests or topics, see Jackson 102 is at cox.net is the place to send it. Thank you for listening. Be sure to tell a friend and Alistair. I want to thank you for your time and, and your great stories. You're definitely a great storyteller. Oh, thank you. And all the best to you, Curtis. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.